your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people just like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Today's guest I made, met probably about eight years ago when I was a speaker for the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii, and she came to my presentation. And since then, we've seen each other at conferences where we're both speakers. She is as smart as she is beautiful. She is a surgeon in Maui, the most beautiful place in the world that now, ha now has two amazing, well, actually three amazing plant-based doctors in Maui, Dr. Hawk. Dr. Gregor and today's guest. Her name is, oh my God, I practiced <laughs> it. Minna. I know, I practiced it all day and I knew this would happen. Oh. Ermina Van Dyken, and she is a general and a trauma surgeon. But what's really unique is that she literally was the first doctor in Hawaii to be certified in lifestyle medicine. So we're going to hear about how she uses that in her practice. And she's going to talk about many things, including breast cancer prevention and survival. Please welcome Dr. Van Dyke into the show. And thank you for saying your name. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Yeah. So my name is Irmina. Um, as Chef AJ said, I live here on Maui and she's right. This is the best place on earth. So hopefully some of you guys can make it out here and visit us. Uh, but yeah, here on Maui, I, I'm a surgeon, a general surgeon mostly. So I do a lot of general surgeries, you know, things like taking out gallbladders, things like um, colon surgery. But um, one of my big passions that I really like to do is taking care of breast cancer patients and surgically. And so that's kind of a niche that I really like to get into. Um, talking about lifestyle medicine, I have had a passion for that for years. So it's, it's been going back a long ways. And I was fortunate enough to get board certified in lifestyle medicine through the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. And that was a few years ago. So I, I've really been enjoying working that into my practice and working in every little way I can, anything that has to do with lifestyle as far as um, how it intertwines and interfaces with surgical stuff. So it's, it's a good, good mix. It's a, you have a wonderful presentation, actually you have many wonderful presentations on YouTube that I can link to, and you have your own YouTube page, which I'm going to link to, but you, you specifically actually did one for the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii on, on breast cancer. It was fabulous. I watched it yesterday. Thank you. Yeah. So the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii, just a plug for them, for those of you that don't know, um, I'm actually a board member for them. So not a conflict of interest, but I am very passionate about all that. Um, they used to, before the pandemic, have monthly lectures where we'd bring in big um, lecturers, important people, people that had stuff to share, like Chef AJ, and um, we'd bring them in, you know, every month. And now we are working to do that all virtually, but we have a whole library of free YouTube lectures that you can go check out. And it's a great resource. So I totally recommend you check it out, Vegetarian Society of Hawaii YouTube channel. Um, but yeah, I, I speak for them almost every year on some topic or another, and it's fun. That is so great. What is the vegan and vegetarian scene like in Hawaii in general and Maui specifically? So Maui is interesting. It's an interesting place. And I do feel like there are a lot of vegan and vegetarian opportunities here. There's a lot of people that live this way and may not even identify as being vegan or vegetarian. You know, there's just so much farm fresh food and they're eating a lot of vegetables, that type of thing. Um, going out to eat, any of the restaurants definitely have good options, no matter where you are, even if you're in a steakhouse, really. So that's super nice. Um, but on the flip side, there's a lot of um, places here and culture here that love spam and processed food and, you know, uh, very big plates of food that are very unhealthy. So it's a big mix for sure. You know, I imagine as a surgeon, by the time somebody sees you, it's usually because something has already manifested that they need taken care of. So how then can you implement lifestyle medicine, which in many ways is, is preventative? True, true. But you have to remember that when people come to me, um, a lot of times surgery is an option, but it may not be necessary, may not be 100% necessary. So we definitely try to um, offer non-operative options, say, Something people don't really like to talk about, but lots of people have are hemorrhoids, for example. That's something that we can do non-operatively um, and do a lot of lifestyle changes that can really matter. So um, yeah, I try to implement that. The other thing is when you look at surgical issues, so many of them are lifestyle related. You think about gallbladder, right? Gallbladder problems and gallstones. Those are mostly cholesterol stones. And there's something that, um, 
we can prevent, as you said, with lifestyle changes, with avoiding, you know, trans fats and fatty cholesterol laden foods. So we can work that in as well. Um, in the context of say breast cancer or colon issues like diverticular disease, we can definitely work and make them less severe. The diverticular disease, for example, we can work on tuning up the microbiome. We can work on getting a lot of fiber and prebiotics into the, the lifestyle that people may not have had before. So there's definitely a role for lifestyle medicine when it comes to surgery. Definitely. That's so cool. So I would imagine the patients that find you come to you, not necessarily because you're plant-based. No, not at all. Um, there are some that know that, or they end up Googling me because I would be their surgeon and they find that out as a side, but um, it's a really good opportunity for me to be able to interface with these people and um, try to make changes, small changes. You know, Sometimes it is not going from a regular Hawaiian diet or standard American diet, whatever it is to whole food, plant-based, no oil, right? It's a whole continuum and being able to just help foster some of those changes are, it's very exciting and rewarding for me. How did you first start your plant-based journey? And I imagine your family is now on board. Yeah. So I, I was fortunate enough to be raised macrobiotic. So that's a whole different story, but I was very fortunate to not be raised on candy bars and all of that type of stuff. Um, I was vegetarian since I was nine years old, and that was a personal decision that my family um, intermittently has followed me and not. But um, even when I was in surgical residency, you know, being a surgical resident, you have grueling, you know, 30 hour shifts right back then. And um, I, I had to have my bagel with the egg and cheese on it. I was vegetarian, but I sure loved my cheese. You know, I'm a Dutch girl too, love cheese, right? So it took a while. And then in 2010, I really decided I needed to make the change. And it was kind of by accident. I got my husband on board and we went for it and we haven't looked back, honestly. That's amazing. So what do, what, what do you tell your patients when they have breast cancer? Um, that's a complex question. I think it depends on the type and how advanced it is, et cetera. Uh, but aside from the regular, um, say, medical and surgical suggestions, we do talk a lot about um, survivorship and how to prevent this cancer from coming back. So one important thing, so we know that a lot of cancers and breast cancer in particular can be related to lifestyle. So really only like five to 10% of breast cancer is um, genetic, which is gonna happen no matter what. So um, the rest of it is either a random mutation in your genes as they divide, it could be um, it could be lifestyle related, could be obesity related, et cetera. And I really have to make it clear to my patients that this breast cancer, it's not your fault. It's nothing that you did in your lifetime. And hopefully we can get to a point where if we treat it, we can increase chances of survival. And that's really where it's at. Once you've been diagnosed, you really wanna make sure you can treat it and maximize chances of survival. So how can that be? Well, you can do many things to increase survival. Um, and they're all lifestyle related. And I, I'm not like a completely lifestyle and no surgery type of person. I mean, I am a surgeon, but I find a balance in there, right? So it, it's definitely, lifestyle changes that I emphasize, because that's the thing we have control over. So um, working on minimizing the fat, our body fat, right? Weight management is huge. Most breast cancers are estrogen related, right? They kind of feed off of estrogen, if you will. So trying to minimize that estrogen in your body is a great thing. And one thing a lot of people don't know is that body fat, our fat cells, especially when we're postmenopausal as a woman, um, they make estrogen. So our fat cells make estrogen. So the less we have them, the better off we're going to be if we have a breast cancer that feeds off of estrogen. So that is a huge thing. Yeah. We, we, it, I host a summit called the truth about weight loss. And that I didn't know that about the link between being overweight or obese and certain cancers. Yeah. Um, it's been shown not only in breast cancer, but colon cancer, uh, prostate cancer, and it, it's a very strong relationship. But you know what else is really interesting? Um, there was a paper that was published and they were talking about um, body type and cancer, risk of your breast cancer coming back. And when you look at that, it's actually a U-shaped curve. And what I mean by that is if you are severely underweight, 
but to the point where you don't have muscle mass, if you have lost muscle mass, your chance of the cancer coming back is actually higher than if you are normal weight. And then, so it kind of, if you're normal weight, your risk is pretty low, but then as you get more and more obese, it skyrockets. The chance of your cancer coming back goes up quite a bit. So you want to make sure that you are lean, but you don't want to be so lean that you're something called sarcopenic and you don't have any muscle mass. So you've got to exercise. You got to do the resistance training as a breast cancer survivor. The best thing you can do aerobic exercise plus weight training. And those two things, um, are really, really going to be the best as far as exercise goes. And, and, you know, right now, colon cancer is what everybody's talking about. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And colon cancer, again, is one of those things, lifestyle related. Yes, there is a genetic component, right, to a small percentage, but um, lifestyle is huge. So things like fiber, fiber is probably the best thing you can do to prevent actually not only colon cancer, but breast cancer too. Um, I, I want to just segue a little bit into the microbiome because I can't talk about fiber without talking about the microbiome. Essentially, the microbiome, I'm sure as your listeners probably are well aware, the microbiome is dictating so much of our health these days. So basically we are outnumbered, our human body cells, we have 10 times the amount of bacteria, viruses, fungi that live in our body, in and around on our skin, in our GI tract, the majority of them live in our GI tract. Um, and these bacteria, they dictate our overall health. It's unreal, the overall health that, that like happens based on our bacteria profile. You can have a bacterial profile where you are pro-inflammatory and it's a setup for developing heart disease and sometimes even cancers. Um, so when it comes to the microbiome, yes, strongly linked to colon cancer, but also we're finding new research where it's being linked to breast cancer. So there's something called the estrobolome, and I don't know if you've heard of that, but it's basically the metabolism of estrogen in your body as it relates to your microbiome. And it's very fascinating stuff. So what we're finding is that if you have good bacteria in your gut, it's going to metabolize the estrogen to get it out of your system. And remember how we talked about estrogen in excess is not a good thing for breast cancer. So it's going to get it out of your system. If you have an unhealthy microbiome that is formed by the standard American diet, by processed foods, et cetera, low fiber, you're gonna have this estrogen that just keeps getting recycled and living in your body and uh, honestly wreaking havoc if you look at it from a breast cancer perspective. So high fiber diet, um, eating plenty of fruits, vegetables, nuts, legumes, variety is huge to get that good microbiome profile. So we have a question from Elizabeth and she says, okay. does she mean that being skinny can increase your risk if you don't have muscle? Um, yes, that's what the study showed is basically if you are underweight and you do not have muscle mass. So if you are skinny, but you have muscle, that's a different story, right? That's fine. But you need to make sure you maintain muscle. That's very important. So yes, so low muscle mass and skinny can increase risk. Nice. There's a question at this, uh, the chat that I'm watching moves quickly asking if you could talk mm -hmm. about, I think it was PC. Can she talk about, I'm sorry, PC PCOS. I, I, I thought she wrote PCIS, but let me, let me find it. No, no, sorry. DCIS. I never heard oh, of it. DCIS. Okay. So that's a good question. DCIS is a type of breast cancer. And when we look at breast cancers, we classify them as to um, whether they have lived within the milk ducts of the breast, essentially or whether they've broken through and kind of invaded. So if they are still within the milk ducts, um, we call that a DCIS or a ductal carcinoma in situ. And that is an early breast cancer. It has not broken through the ducts. Um, some people think of it as less aggressive. So if you have a DCIS, if you look at cancer stages, if it stays strictly DCIS, you're gonna be a stage zero. So it's a very early cancer. Um, it's not technically invasive cancer, if that makes sense. So DCIS is one of those things we are picking up and we pick up early because we do mammograms, right? So we pick up these abnormalities and we find DCIS. Um, the one thing that I would say about DCIS is it's a little bit insidious. It kind of likes to travel along the milk duct. So um, you can have a very huge section of the breast that has DCIS as opposed to an invasive cancer, which is a very small section of the breast. So you have to take that into account when you manage it. But I would say on the forefront of breast cancer management, DCIS is one of those that 
is kind of getting more controversial as far as what do we do with it? Because it is such an early breast cancer. Interesting. Uh, Arlene, who's watching live, says she's a DCIS survivor and it came back twice. And Jane says, triple negative, any specific diet tips? Oh uh, yeah, Jane, um, triple negative cancer is a tough one because that uh, everything I just said about estrogen does not apply, doesn't apply because that breast cancer doesn't feed off of estrogen. Um, so diet tips, we don't care. I mean, we always care, but we don't care so much about the estrogen anymore, but I would say what we want to care about is, um, maintaining a healthy weight, lowering the inflammation in our body, just lowering the chances of any of that cancer coming back. So that would be, um, whole food, plant-based diet, lots of things that lower inflammation, packing the turmeric, for example, is a really good one just really trying to um, optimize the inflammatory status in your body. Okay. Uh, Tiffany says, please address the consumption of soy and HER2 plus estrogen in a estrogen receptive breast cancer. And Elizabeth said, what did you, what do you think of non-GMO soy? Good, good questions. I kind of anticipated this one because I get it a lot. Um, Soy, it's been really controversial. If you look back maybe 10 years ago, scientists and medical doctors were saying, don't touch soy, don't eat it because it has phytoestrogens, right? So phytoestrogens are these estrogens that are pretty metabolically similar, structurally similar to the estrogen our body makes. Well, that has totally shifted 180. There are huge studies showing that soy is safe. Soy is safe, even if you are a breast cancer survivor. Um, Huge population studies out of Japan and the US that show actually the one in Japan showed that women who had soy, and this was in the form of soy milk actually, women who had soy um, after breast cancer actually had increased survival compared to the women who did not eat soy. And the reason this is, is because the soy, this phytoestrogen, it actually blocks to our estrogen receptors in our body and it doesn't allow our normal estrogen to bond and cause problems. So it kind of decreases your your risk of the cancer. So it's an interesting thing. When we say soy though, we have to be really clear about that. So the soy, it's not isolated soy protein, right? It's not the stuff you're gonna find in protein shakes or you know, all the processed foods, the fake meats that has isolated soy protein. No, we're talking unprocessed soy. So that's gonna be soy milk. I consider tofu unprocessed, um, tempeh, that type of thing. Those are okay, natto. I don't know if any of you guys know about natto. It's good stuff. It's fermented, it's good for your microbiome and it's soy. So um, all of that is okay and actually highly recommended. That is great. Jay says, what are the treatment options for PCOS? PCOS, that is not my specialty to be honest. Um, That's definitely GYN and it can get very complicated. But again, trying to minimize the hormonal fluctuations, that's the best we can do to treat PCOS. Um, So minimizing hormonal fluctuations, one of the best ways we can do that is fiber. Fiber seems to be this sponge that absorbs excess hormones, et cetera. So packing that fiber in your diet is a really good strategy. I've seen people have good results going to True North and fasting with that condition. Yes, yes. Um, And also weight loss, right? So um, PCOS a lot of times is linked to being overweight. And if we can get any of that weight off, you know, by whatever means possible, whether it's fasting or, um, you know, a whole food plant based diet, just doing that is going to be huge. So many people that I've, I mean, again, this isn't everybody. So if it's not you don't say, but that wasn't me, just personally, all the women I've known that had breast cancer, they've always drank alcohol and they continue to drink it. And what I hear is that that maybe isn't such a good thing for people that have had cancer. Yeah, that is a really good point. So alcohol is actually a direct carcinogen when it comes to breast cancer. And a lot of people don't know that. So even you know, over one drink a day is where the official guidelines are. So for women, they say don't surpass one drink a day, but even that, even one drink a day can be carcinogenic and it increases your risk of breast cancer. So, um, yeah, I definitely would say, try to stay away from alcohol. If you are a breast cancer survivor or you want to lower your risk. Nice. Terrific. Let's see if we have any more questions. Oh, here it is. Um, Oh, I I guess Arlene was saying, does it interfere with aromatase inhibitors or enhance them? I'm guessing that was when you were talking about soy. 
about the soy, I have not seen any data that shows that it interferes with them at all. So they're very safe to be taken, the two of them together. Uh, Sharon yeah. wants to know, what do you say about caffeine and risk? You know, Sharon, I don't know. I have never seen any studies that show caffeine is linked at all to um, breast cancer. There was actually a paper published, I think it was a month ago in the New England Journal of Medicine, which is one of our prestigious journals. And they talked about overall effects of caffeine just on overall health. And they did look at cancer specifically, and there was no increased risk of any type of cancer with caffeine intake. So um, I, I have not seen any data showing that it would be a risk. I, again, not a doctor, but the people that I've known that have had certain breast issues, their doctors have yeah. told them no caffeine, no chocolate, just that, that they were that's what I've heard from some people. I'm not sure. That's why. interesting. Yeah. I, I'm not sure about the evidence on that. I would say if anything, chocolate, the dark unsweetened variety has actually got some phytonutrients in it and could be beneficial. Okay. Let's see. A Phyllis says, how much fiber should we have in a day? Oh, uh, well, you can't have too much. Just kidding. <laughs> so um, I would say that the U S dietary guidelines of fiber are too low. So that's 35 grams a day for women, 45 for men, roughly, it's too low. And we know that eating fiber way up, upwards of like 90 to 100 grams a day is going to be good for overall health. It's kind of like the more, the better. But I would say that if you are transitioning from a low or no fiber diet to fiber, you just want to be really careful when you do it. You don't want to eat tons and tons of fiber and um, not drink enough water because you'll basically feel quite bloated, feel like you've swallowed a cork, essentially, you'll be a little constipated. So gradual, right? Gradual increase in fiber is the way to go. Um, you, honestly, it's hard to overdo it on fiber. So I would just work on packing as much of it in as you possibly can. Great. A question, how does breast size influence risk? Hmm. That's a good question too. And honestly, I don't know. And I, I don't think it's going to make a difference because breast cancer is more genetically, hormonally driven, lifestyle driven. I, I don't think that say a large breasted person, if they were to get a breast reduction, I don't think it's going to decrease their risk. You know, it's funny because we always talk about women breast cancer. I actually had a male yeah. friend who got it in his yeah. 70s and you know, men don't go for routine mammograms. So how does a man even, you know, know that, that he's at risk or that he has it? You're right. And, and the men actually do represent a small but substantial proportion of breast cancer patients. And th the only way they find it is if they feel a lump. So, you know, uh, something that they're just feeling and they may think it's a glob of fat, but if it keeps growing, you know, then, you know, you've got a breast cancer. So yeah, it does happen in men. Men have breast tissue. So it is something to be aware of. Yeah. Let's yeah. see. Arlene says, can you please talk about what the diet should be during the radiation treatment? Diet what during to, radiation? Yeah. What to avoid and what to include. So diet during radiation treatment, there's really not much that you have to avoid. Um, the lowest inflammatory foods are going to be better. But if you contrast that, say, with the diet that while you're on chemotherapy, if you were to need chemotherapy, that's totally different. So when my patients are on chemotherapy, I don't recommend that we take a lot of the supplements, the stuff that we, I would recommend when you're recovering things like high dose turmeric, um, broccoli and broccoli sprouts, that type of thing. I do not recommend just because it can interfere with the treatment. So, um, radiation, not so much restriction needed, but for chemotherapy, yes, there's definitely some differences that have to be made. Mm. Jaylene yeah. has made a comment. Be sure to avoid breast implants. The studies now are scary. Well, do you know anything about that? Yeah, I definitely do. So there's something called breast implant associated illness, and that's been coming much more frequently. Um, and it's an issue where women are seeming to have this reaction to breast implants and not every woman, it just happens randomly. So um, many women who get breast implants tolerate it just fine. I will come out there and say that, but some women have issues and it, leads to your immune system kind of overreacting. There are so many reports of women that are having joint pains, issues, kind of like an autoimmune condition, you know, like a rheumatoid type situation. And they've been 
linking it back to breast implants. So a lot of the implants that these came from were textured breast implants, which have actually been banned now. We can't even use them uh, because of this. And um, it's, yeah, it, it's definitely a real entity and it's something to keep an eye out for. Now there's also a very rare malignancy that is linked to breast implants as well, but it's very, very rare. And um, if anybody has any suspicion of that, they really should talk to their doctor right away. Great. Lita says she's unable to have mammograms and does thermography. Is that, is that good enough? Uh, I would like to know Lita why you're unable to have mammograms, but um, thermography is a technology that was developed uh, mostly not in the U S and it's trying to figure out kind of like hot spots, right? So it's looking for breast cancer cells and it kind of scans the entire breast and it will tell you if you have an area that looks suspicious. The thing about thermography is its accuracy levels is just not as good as mammograms. Um, I, for just as anecdotal, but I had one patient who had a five centimeter breast tumor. We knew about, we biopsied it and she went and got thermography and it was negative. There was nothing. So um, it, it's not as sensitive as a mammogram and it's not recommended by any of the official guidelines. It's kind of a, a side thing. Nice. You know, it's funny, um, not uh, right now, nobody's volunteering anywhere, but before the shutdown, I was volunteering at, at a cancer place, you know, doing pet therapy. And that, so I would spend a lot of time with the patients while they were having their infusions. And so they were there for many hours. And so they would come and bring them lunch. And lunch mm -hmm. was, was uh, some kind of a meat sandwich, meat and cheese sandwich on white bread with mayo, uh, their choice of chips. You know, they could have Doritos or Cheetos, uh, a, a sugar sweetened beverage and some kind of cookie for dessert. And, you know, I, you know I, I, as a volunteer, I could not say anything. I mean, I, I would get fired. And, but the thing is, is when they did talk about nutrition, they said, oh, my doctor said, it doesn't matter what I eat. And that seems to be the prevailing view of people that aren't lifestyle medicine doctors, that it doesn't matter what we eat. And yet, as I interview doctors for all my summits, they say, what you eat is probably the most important question you can ask your patient. That is so true. And I agree with that. What you eat is the most important question you can ask. And it's, it's a tragedy. It's a tragedy that medical schools don't have more nutrition education. It's a tragedy, tragedy that it's not being um, emphasized at the conferences for different specialties, et cetera. Um, my medical school, I had, I think, two hours of nutrition training. And one of them was a nutritionist telling us that margarine was a better alternative to butter, you know, and it was just, um, it, it was a very tough, tough education, right? But I will say things are changing. Um, if you look at national society meetings, the cardiology meeting is a beautiful example of that. Um, I think, I'm not sure if it was American Card College of Cardiology or one of the big national conferences, they had lots of lectures on diet, heart disease, um, all sorts of stuff like that. And you see that changing, you see that education going out there, um, which is very exciting to see. So I think, I think things are changing. I'm an optimist perpetually, but I do think it's changing. Nice. Dr. Riz is watching and he says, hello, my friend, how can exercise help with breast cancer, if at all? I love it. Hi, Dr. Riz. We miss you on Maui. He's he comes here pretty regularly and hasn't been for a while. But um, so to answer the question, exercise is huge when it comes to breast cancer. And um, I had mentioned a little bit before about the exercise and survivorship, et cetera, with breast cancer. Um, and that one paper that I referenced. So this was a paper. It was published in British Medical Journal last year. And they were looking at breast cancer patients and other patients, and they were looking at overall survival rates, basically. And there were four out of five lifestyle factors that they wanted to see if you met. And if you meet four out of those five lifestyle factors, your risk drops. So they found overall living. So women lived 11 years longer um, with these lifestyle factors and men lived eight years longer. And this is just overall survival. But what was interesting is when they looked at cancer patients alone, if they adopted four of those five things, they lived 22 years longer on average than expected. That's huge. So five lifestyle factors, which are huge. And my segue into that is yes, exercise is definitely one of those, right? Exercise is huge. 
Second one is going to be diet. You have to have to have a good diet. Um, and even in this study, they didn't look at whole food plant based. They didn't look at vegan. They just looked at how many servings of fruits and vegetables do you eat a day? Minimum of five, right? That met the requirement. So five servings. And you'd be surprised. Most Americans don't get five servings of fruits and vegetables a day. It's hard to get, very hard to get. Um, the next requirement is a healthy BMI. Got to have a healthy weight. You don't want to be overweight or underweight like we talked about. Um, the next one is not smoking. So you got to cut out smoking, which is pretty obvious. And then the last factor is moderate or no alcohol use. So those are the five factors. And the women that met four of those five factors, 22 years longer if they had cancer, 22 years longer life expectancy. So yes, exercise is huge. Back to your question, Dr. Riz, huge. Nice. So Lita, who asked the question or about the thermography, said it's not that she can't have them. She doesn't like them. She's just not in favor of them. And then we have other people like Charlene saying, how often do you recommend mammograms? And then somebody, uh, Isabella is saying mammograms cause a lot of breast cancer. So what is your take on mammograms? Yeah. How often? That's a very controversial issue. It is. And, you know, I think the data is still pouring in as far as that is concerned. Because of the risk of the radiation dose from mammograms, there are some guidelines that are changing. They're telling women instead of every year to have a mammogram every two years or one to two years, depending on the discussions you have with your physician. So um, it's an individual decision. It is. Mammograms are a very good tool for detecting breast cancer. I have seen them save lives and I am definitely an advocate. But yes, I do acknowledge it's a controversial thing. And there are some schools of thought that do think that they increase breast cancer risk, just the repetitiveness. So it's one of those things per the guidelines. If you have a mammogram that's stable and there's nothing suspicious on it, you could wait two years, you know, then you're getting less often of a mammogram and less often of a radiation dose. Um, I just, I'm, I'm just so jealous of your background and hearing those birds. Beautiful. Oh, I know. I, we live in paradise. By yeah, the way, right. this is beautiful. This is Eyal Valley right here. So it's a, a valley you can hike up. It's just full of history. There's many ancient Hawaiians that had battles in this valley. It's, it's actually a very beautiful place. So well, what's interesting is I interview so many doctors all over the world, and they often use these Zoom backgrounds that look like your background, but yours is actually real. Mine is real, yeah. <laughs> not a fake background. Yeah, right. Linda wants yeah. to know if you have many plant-based colleagues. Actually, thank you, Linda. I do. Um, I'm fortunate enough to be in the Kaiser system. So I, um, I'm in an environment where eating healthy, um, and they don't call it plant-based, they call it plant-forward. So where plant-forward eating is very encouraged. Um, I have many colleagues just working around me that see the value of it, advise their patients in that manner and um, are advocates. So yeah, I, I'm lucky. And again, it's one of those things that are changing. I do think that the younger generation of doctors is very much adopting this lifestyle medicine and seeing how important it is when it comes to preventing chronic diseases. Great. Maya says, how has the pandemic affected your work and your lunch and learns? Oh, Maya, thank you. Um, so for a while we were shut down with surgeries, which was an interesting thing, um, which did land me working in the COVID unit for a while. And luckily we're back doing surgeries now. We are up um, on schedule and that's not really changed too much as far as the pandemic goes. Um, the lunch and learn. So I was doing a lunch and learn series for my colleagues and basically it was fun. We had um, lectures that lasted about an hour talking about lifestyle medicine and different things. And that was a monthly thing. And those have actually been on hold as many of my meetings have been right now. It's just, everything is kind of on hold. Hopefully we can get that going soon. I think now more than ever is the time that lifestyle medicine needs to be front and center for preventing illness and preventing chronic disease. And um, I'm sure other speakers have also said on your show, AJ, that comorbidities is like the number one thing that's going to influence mortality when it comes to coronavirus. So if we can lose weight, we can decrease those comorbidities like high blood pressure, et cetera, that's going to improve survival. So now more than ever, we've got we've to push it and promote it. 
Yeah, I agree. So Shane wants to know, what do you think about broccoli sprouts for somebody that doesn't have cancer? Because I know you, I heard on your lecture that you're a fan of them, especially for people that do. Uh, yeah, good question. Yes, I'm, I'm a huge fan of broccoli sprouts. I sprout broccoli every single day. Um, it's so easy. All you need is a mason jar, um, some broccoli seeds. You can buy a huge bag of organic broccoli seeds on Amazon and you sprout. And the thing is broccoli seeds, and I don't want to get like too technical, but um, there is a pathway called the NRF2 pathway, and it's an anti-inflammatory metabolic pathway in our body. Broccoli seeds are the most potent activators of that. So they are the most potent thing we know to shut or to shut down inflammation and to increase our anti-inflammatory pathway. So yes, I love broccoli sprouts. I put them on my toast in the morning. Um, the, the important thing with broccoli sprouts you want to know is you got to chew them. You need to chew, 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 chew to activate that myrosinase. Otherwise, I mean, it's not going to work. You can't like swallow a broccoli sprout whole. It probably won't work. So you've got to chew, you could put in a smoothie. That's another option. Um, it's, it's really, really fascinating stuff. And yeah, I recommend broccoli sprouts, cancer or no cancer. It's very important. I'd love for you to make a video of how to make them because I've seen micro sprouts here, but I have not yet seen broccoli sprouts where I live now. Oh, well, I will do a video then it's super simple. It's honestly, you just take a mason jar, pour a few broccoli seeds in there. And then you have like the little screen topping on the mason jar. And then basically you invert this jar and you rinse it at least two times a day. Here in Hawaii, it's hotter. So we rinse it three times a day. And then you just put it on the rack, you let it dry. And then within two to three days, you have beautiful little sprouts. Uh, they're a little spicy. They take a little bit of getting used to, but they're delicious and they're so healthy for you. So the highest sulforaphane content, which is the, the compound that we like to promote for anti-cancer, anti-inflammation, Highest sulforaphane content is about two to three days old sprouts. So that's where you want to be. If you eat just enough broccoli, can that make up for not having sprouts? Because I love broccoli probably more than any other vegetable. And I eat it, I think every yeah. day. Yeah. So broccoli does have sulforaphane. The problem is broccoli sprouts have 10 times more sulforaphane than broccoli. Okay. So, so I'll just eat 10 times as much broccoli. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But I, I don't know. That'd be a lot of broccoli. I know. I, but if I can learn to make them, I will. Like I said, I really, I don't live in LA anymore and I haven't seen them. So there you uh, go. Okay. Yeah. Um, before we move from broccoli sprouts, one other really quick hack to help with that sulforaphane is actually to put mustard powder on it or eat it with mustard. I know it sounds weird, but um, mustard has that myrosinase enzyme. So it's really going to help get that sulforaphane in your body and doing what it's supposed to do. Well, I make a marinade with uh, the salt tree mustard and balsamic vinegar that is great on every single vegetable. So beautiful. You're be set then. Yeah, absolutely. Let's see. Uh, but, um, but no, she didn't say no broccoli sprouts. If you don't have cancer, she's, pro she's pro broccoli spout sprouts for everyone. Okay. Yep, for everyone healthy or not. Okay. So uh, there's a question. Has she ever encountered fibroid type tissue in the breast that can be mistaken for cancer? Oh, um, okay. That's a good question. So fibroid tissue in the breast, that's super common. I would say the majority of women have some sort of fibroid or we call it fibroglandular tissue. That's a normal thing. Um, can it be mistaken for a cancer? So at the end of the day, no. But what happens, say, how is a fibroid found? I would say most of the time, it's a young woman who feels a lump in her breast. So she comes into clinic, lump in her breast, and we evaluate it, this lump. So I look for things that look for changes that are signs of cancer, things like it's being fixed to the underlying tissue, so it's not mobile, um, changes to the skin overlying it. We call, there's a finding called peau d'orange, which is um, it, it means orange skin in French. And when you have breast cancer under the skin, it kind of looks like the skin of an orange. It's dimpled and swollen looking. Um, inverted nipple, nipple discharge. We've tried to find out all this stuff. Is it a regular round mass or is it not? And we can usually tell a lot just from that. But if we take a look with an ultrasound machine, so the ultrasound, no radiation, it's a beautiful test. We can do it in the office and we just look and there's so many characteristics via ultrasound. We can say comfortably, oh yeah, this is a fibroadenoma. This is not a problem. We don't have to worry about it. But if there's any question at all, we would biopsy it with a little needle and the biopsy is definitive. So the biopsy will say cancer versus not. And um, 
yeah, it's invasive. You have to have a little needle stuck in your breast to biopsy the mass. But if there's any concern at all, I think it's better to know than not. Right. Kathy says yeah. she had very dense breasts and had mm -hmm. uh, 12 mammograms in one year. Is there a better option? Ooh, that's a lot. Wow. Um, I, I'm sorry. I'm not sure how you got 12 in one year. That seems like major overkill. So um, even for dense breasts, dense breasts are difficult there. We do know that when you have dense breasts, mammograms don't pick up the cancer um, as much as a woman who does not have dense breasts. So it's a little more difficult. There are other things we can do. Um, coupling mammogram with ultrasound is really, really helpful or um, there is 3D mammograms. The 3D mammograms you may or may not wanna do. They're good for dense breasts, but it's a little more radiation dose. So back to our conversation about radiation from mammograms, you may or may not wanna proceed that way. Um, the last one is if you are at high risk, like say you have a personal history of cancer or a family history, um, an MRI scan is the best. That is the best test we have to look at breast tissue um, there's no radiation involved and it's a really good test. So uh, if you are for some reason needing 12 mammograms a year, it might be a good idea to bring up an MRI scan with your provider and see if that's some way, somewhere you could go. Yeah. yeah thank you. I'm sure that'll be very helpful. Uh, mm -hmm. Question about uh, from Stephanie, if you cook bro broccoli sprouts in a super stir fry, does it kill the health benefits? So that's a great question. And interestingly, if you heat it up to about 110 degrees, it actually increases the health benefits. But if you go past that, you're going to find that the health benefits are gone. So that morosinase, that enzyme is gone, but you can hack that. So you can hack that by putting the mustard on, right? So you're adding external myrosinase again, and then yeah, cook it all you want, put it in a stir fry, just make sure you put mustard. Um, another interesting and also delicious source of morosinase is daikon or radishes. So you can put that somehow, if you can incorporate that into what you're eating, then you're also okay. Nice. Okay. Let's see. Arlene says, does MRI ever miss invasive cancers? Uh, very, very rarely. MRI is so sensitive. It's a very good test. The actual problem with MRI is that we're finding too many abnormal lesions that we have to investigate. So um, it's no, it's very, very rare. Okay. Elizabeth says, I heard biopsies are dangerous and can spread it to other tissues faster if it's cancer. Can she speak on that? And Isabel concurs that, that the, caps, the cancer stays encapsulated for a reason and that biopsy is another cause of the spread. So could you please speak to that? Mm. Yeah, so I've heard that before from patients. There is no evidence whatsoever that shows that biopsy will cause spread of cancer. We biopsy many lesions and it does not cause a spread. Um, it's a theoretical thing that has kind of caught popularity among social media, et cetera, but there is no evidence that has not shown, been shown to be true. Okay. Sarisha Sir says, do broccoli microgreens have the same amount of salt for fewer, whatever you said. Sulforaphane, yeah. Thank you. It's, it's actually harder to pronounce than your name, believe it or not, <laughs> as in sprouts. My young son grows them and sells them. Oh, uh, no. So uh, normal sprouts do not have the sulforaphane. Broccoli sprouts are the highest concentration of sulforaphane that we know of. Um, there are other types of sprouts like radish sprouts. So any of the cruciferous sprouts, they're going to have sulforaphane as well. But your regular like alfalfa, it's pretty negligible, the amount of sulforaphane there. So you really want it to be broccoli sprouts. Right. Um, but yeah, you should have your son make and sell broccoli sprouts. Absolutely. I'll buy some too. I don't know where you live. It, does it have to be the mustard powder or is just mustard okay? Or is that just not enough of a concentration? Yeah. So the studies were done with mustard powder, but the regular mustard also has the same enzyme. So whatever you feel is tasty. Thank you. Wendy yeah. says, is deodorant a culprit in breast cancer? Is aluminum in the deodorant an issue? Another good question, but studies have never, ever shown this. So I know it is a common thought that the aluminum and deodorants can cause breast cancer. Other concerns like could cause Alzheimer's, et cetera. And it's a hard thing to study, right? How do you separate a group of women into using um, aluminum-based deodorants versus not, and it has not been shown to be true. So that is another one of those 
uh, myths per se that we haven't proven right or wrong at this point in time. That being said, why would you need, I mean, try to stay away from a deodorant that has chemicals in it and has aluminum in it. It's much better to go for the natural deodorants um, than the ones that don't have any of that stuff in it. You can buy them. They're plentiful. They work. Um, there's actually a lot of them coming online that are pretty popular. So, um, and that goes, while we're on that topic, that does go to cosmetics and beauty supplies and shampoos. And we are like, dousing our bodies in so many chemicals just from, you know, parabens, phthalates, these are <clears throat> endocrine disruptors, right? And they disrupt our entire body and we need to get away from them as much as we possibly can. So trying to shop for clean beauty products, if you use beauty products, shampoos, toothpaste, deodorant, you want the clean stuff. It's really, really important. You know, I, I had um, laser hair removal. And since then, I don't uh -huh. need deodorant or antiperspirant. It's like amazing because I just, you know. Yeah. And that also comes back to the microbiome. If you have a healthier microbiome in general, you are not going to have this perspirant that smells, et cetera. Um, I think especially Americans, but human beings in general have done themselves a disservice by trying to be too clean. And I know that sounds weird, but trying to really sterilize their bodies, um, scrubbing with soap every single day, the anti-acne mouth or uh, face soaps, the mouthwashes that have alcohol in them, they're damaging our microbiome. And it, it really shows. Well, I have a Dr. Robin Chutkin as a guest on Wednesday, and I know she's a big fan of, of getting dirty. The thing is, you know, yeah. but you know, when you exercise every day and sweat, I, I understand not using soap, but I can't imagine not showering to some degree every day. You know what I mean? Cause you oh, yeah. just, yeah, no, I totally agree. And I, I exercise too. That's the first thing I get up every morning. I do my aerobic exercise and I'm drenched in sweat. I go, I shower. I don't use soap per se. I use them on the stinky bits. I call them right. So the armpits, the groin, that's it. I don't use yeah. it on the rest of my body. I shampoo once a week. So it's very much trying to foster the microbiome and and yeah. it works fine. So my showering is okay. The soap, not so much. My mom used to call that a PTA bath. And I'll let you guys figure out what the acronym is. Cause we don't say those things on, <laughs> on, on the I air. So what, what kind of exercise do you do in the morning? Um, I have gone on the Peloton train, but I don't have a Peloton, which is fine. You know, I've, um, I'm actually going to make a video on that too, is how to rig an old spin bike up to be better than a Peloton yeah. because Pelotons we all know are super expensive. I and know. I have a Kaiser. It was less than $500 and it's like, it's yes. the best. I don't get it. You know, yes. it's like, but but see, I, you know, I buy my clothes at Costco. I'm not a, you know, I'm not into yeah. like labels and, you know, things just because they're <laughs> expensive, but I agree. You don't have to have a Peloton to do those workouts. And you don't, you don't. And like the, the bike I bought is like an old from a spin class bike. I got it for a hundred dollars on Craigslist. It was Whoa. perfect. You wow. know, and then you just add a few things. So I added a little cadence sensor and, you know, a couple things. And, and now I'm doing HIIT workouts, which are my favorite. And they're the best for longevity, by the way. HIIT workouts are better than any other aerobic workout. Um, right. Easy to do. Nice, easy. nice. Mm -hmm. So there's a question. Um, can you talk about why and how, how, how much turmeric you recommend in addition to broccoli sprouts for the purposes of breast cancer prevention? Yeah. So turmeric, again, is one of those spices that can be used in addition to a healthy diet. You can't eat a crap diet and have turmeric and think you're going to be okay, et cetera. But um, minimum turmeric, I would say two teaspoons a day. It's going to be minimum, minimum. Um, you mix turmeric with black pepper and it's going to increase the bioavailability. So the piperine and the black pepper increases it by a lot. So try whatever you're doing, if you're making a sauce or however you're using your turmeric salad dressing, try to mix some black pepper in there as well. I'm allergic to black pepper. Ah, it's my worst, one bad. of my worst allergies, pepper and soy. Well, that's okay. Yeah. I, I'll, eat, I'll eat more broccoli sprouts. So Shane is wondering if you have a YouTube channel and I do keep posting it. I'll post it again. It's called Out of the yeah. Doldrums. And Shane also wants to know what a typical day of eating looks like for you. Mm, thanks for asking that question. Typical day of eating. So um, I actually, and we haven't talked about this at all yet. I am a big proponent of fasting or intermittent fasting. So I do, I enjoy 
skipping breakfast a few days a week. I just feel like mentally clearer that way. I feel like my overall health benefits. So that being said, the days that I do have breakfast, I love just so after my workout, I will have, I am a coffee drinker. So I, I think coffee in general, I like it. <laughs> it's good for overall health. Um, I eat a piece of toast essentially sometimes too. And I like Ezekiel bread. It's unprocessed whole grain. Um, I toast that. And then I will usually make some sort of concoction on top of it. So I will put broccoli sprouts on there. Um, usually some kelp seasoning or something to give it just a little bit of flavor. Um, I do like tahini. So I put tahini on my toast in the mornings and that is my breakfast. For lunch, it's typically leftovers. So we like to recycle whatever we had the night before, which is usually some sort of vegetable uh, mixed with some fresh stuff. And it's, it's a pretty light lunch, working lunch most days. And then for dinner, I would say the number one dinner in my household, and Dr. Riz may laugh at this because he's been to my house to have our number one dinner, is tacos. We love tacos, tacos of any variety. So Tacos are beautiful because you can put whatever you have fresh. We have a huge garden. So whatever we have, we're going to put in our tacos. Okra is coming into season right now, which works really well. Um, we home make our own um, tortilla shells. So we've got organic um, masa harina that we actually make the shells and it's, it's delicious. So we love doing that. That is probably the best thing in the world. So a few days a week for sure, tacos. And that's, that's really what I do in a day. The other thing I like to do is I sip on tea throughout the day. And my go-to tea is a turmeric ginger blend. Um, I just, I, I love it. So I get a lot of my turmeric that way. For those of you that don't like turmeric in real food per se, turmeric tea is such a good way to do it. Nice. Sharon wants to know, are there other lifestyle habits that can reduce your risk of cancer other than not being overweight or obese, such as sleep or stress? Absolutely. Yeah. So um, sleep has been linked for sure to not only breast cancer, but any types of cancer. So there's been studies where we look at shift workers. So people that say work in factories at nights or nurses that have to work at nights and they don't sleep as well as they should, or their circadian rhythm is off. And they actually have a higher risk of cancers and heart disease, which um, was shocking when I first heard that. But the more you think about it, um, our circadian rhythms for so many reasons are very important. And so getting that good quality sleep um, and not sleeping during, you know, when there's no, you, you don't want to be sleeping during the day when the daylight the sun is out and all of that, that's going to be better in the long run. So yeah, sleep is huge. Um, stress reduction. That's a hard one to study. That's a really difficult one to study. And I think we're starting to see a lot of preliminary evidence on that. Um, Dean Ornish has done his work with prostate cancer and his whole Ornish program, which involves a huge aspect of stress reduction. And we're showing that it decreases um, prostate cancer recurrence rates, which is really huge. I know of a few ongoing studies with breast cancer survivorship, which is a similar thing where we're looking at a big program similar to the Ornish program. So clean eating, um, having social support, social networks, and like discussion support groups, and then the stress management and exercise and all those facets as far as decreasing recurrence. So yeah, there's a lot out there. And I think as the studies get done, it's going to be more clear and we'll know more and more. Great. There's just a nice comment that your husband is a hottie. Well, what do you expect? Oh. Cause she's a hottie. So that would make sense because hotties <laughs> like to reproduce with other hotties. <laughs> do you do you remember, AJ, I, we were at a conference in LA once both speaking and you came up and you were so funny. I just remember this vividly. It's probably like six years ago. You come up and you you sit in my lap, essentially, and you're like, hey, da, 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 da. it's been a while since you've seen each other. And you, Russell, my husband, is sitting next to me and you're like, you are so lucky. You have such a hottie. <laughs> it was the cutest thing <laughs> But anyway, yeah, you had no, to be there. But yeah, anyway. no, I, I, I do. I do remember that. So thank you. <laughs> thank you for, for reminding me. Elizabeth says, what brand of turmeric tea do you like? Oh, um, so I'm so spoiled here in Hawaii. I actually grow turmeric in my garden um, and I'm able to just harvest it and grate the roots into a mug with some ginger that I also grow and add hot water. That's ideal. Um, but when that's not available to me, I really like the Tulsi brand. So they have uh, 
what is it? Tulsi turmeric ginger. I think it's made by like nature or organic or something. I don't know. It's the one with the orange box. You see it in all the stores and it's organic and it's turmeric. So, so one thing, and that's a good point with turmeric, you want to watch out for contamination. If you buy cheap, regular old turmeric, um, from who knows where it, it could be laced with things like lead and other metals. So you want to make sure you get it from a good source. Great. Linda wants to know if you're oil free, because I know I remember heard a lecture mm. once by Dr. Joel Furman that especially where cancer and breast cancer is concerned, that oil is not your friend or that. Yeah. So I am not completely oil free. I am mostly, so I, we use oil very sparingly. So for example, a stir fry, a tiny bit of sesame oil for the flavor, right? Um, we don't use oil much at all. And we definitely stay away from those pro inflammatory oils. So I do think there's a lot of research to the omega six to omega three ratio. And a lot of these oils that are high in omega six and low in omega threes, I really stay away from. So um, yes, I do think it's important because it can drive inflammation and inflammation is one of those really hot topics and it contributes to chronic disease. So you. lowering your inflammation from every way you can is the best bet. Terrific. I think we have time for one more question from Susan. Is there ever an option to avoid chemo and radiation after a breast cancer diagnosis? Um, it depends. And I, I know it's a cop-out answer, but breast cancer is a very complicated thing when it comes to surgical decision-making. It's very complicated. Sometimes the cancer is advanced and the recommendations would be, yes, you should get chemotherapy and you should get um, radiation. Other times, if it's caught very early, we can get away with none of that. So let's say you have a DCIS and um, we, we do surgery, it can be curative to the point where you don't need radiation and you don't need chemotherapy. So um, it's a whole spectrum. So that every breast cancer is different and every recommendation is different. And then it all hinges on the decisions that you make as a patient with your surgeon regarding um, what type of surgery you want, even like a lumpectomy versus a mastectomy. So it's, a, it's super, super complicated. And every, 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 it's like a one case, case by case basis, essentially. I always wondered, because I don't know a lot of surgeons, but what do you do if you have to pee when you're doing surgery? <laughs> like, do, do they let you, like, can you leave and can somebody else, like, I always wonder, like, how do you pee? So the longest surgeries that I scrubbed in was when I was in training, actually, like the transplant surgeries, you're looking at like 17 hours sometimes. And yeah, at that point in time, you basically you're like, okay, we're taking a break. And we actually leave and we grab a granola bar, pee, do whatever you do and come back. Um, it's not a big deal because the anesthesiologist is there watching your patient, etc. So it's not like we could leave at any random time in a short, quick surgery and come back and it's all good. I, I think surgeons train themselves, their bodies and have bladders of steel, so to speak. Well, well just so, because, you know, as part uh, we, I recently interviewed a pelvic floor physical therapist about uh, all these urinary problems. And one of the things they said is holding your pee is not a good thing. And I'm thinking like, if you're doing that, that, that can't be so good. Yeah, I, you definitely have some validity to that. Um, I, I do try to make sure before every surgery, I don't have to pee, you know, it's always one of those things. But um, yeah, it's not like we wear diapers or anything, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> or, a or, or a leg bag. Do you, do you have a, yeah. I know that one of the things I heard in podcasts that you chose surgery, cause you like, you like doing things, you like doing procedures. Yeah. Like, do yeah. you have, not that you wish anybody would have surgery, but do you have a favorite operation? That's just like, Whoa, I've got a so-and-so today. Um, it changes day to day. I will tell you, and I know this sounds super weird and maybe a little morbid, but my patients that have anal rectal complaints, they, that is the most gratifying surgery because they're the most grateful out of all my patients. They're so miserable, you know, that by the time they recover from that surgery, they're just so happy. And it's rewarding for me to see how a quick surgery can make such a huge change. So that's, that's up there, honestly. But I, again, I, my passion really is breast cancer surgery and taking care of um, that group of patients. Wow. That's great. And, right, and the so thing, the thing about breast cancer surgery is it gives me the ability to be artistic as well, because you can do something called oncoplastic procedures where you're doing a lumpectomy mixed with a breast lift or trying to leave the patient 
better than before they came to you, which is very cool. That's great. Let, I said last question, but this really is. Do you use from Denise, do you use bioabsorb in your lumpectomy patients and have you seen complications from it? Mm, I do not use bioabsorb. Um, that's a new technology. And uh, so I, because I don't use it, I have not seen any complications from it. No. Great. Well, thank you so much for being plant-based, for being awesome, for the work you do to educate people, regardless that there are things they can do to take control of their health destiny, even if they have had cancer. So I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. This it is, is fun. my pleasure. Anytime. And I can't wait to interview you for the GI Health Summit because I didn't realize you were a microbiome, uh, you know, something that, that, that was interested in that and that could talk about that. So that's going to be great. Definitely. Thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. If you were interested in breast cancer, perhaps you'll come back tomorrow at 11 a.m. when we're going to be talking about colon cancer with Dr. Will B. Take care, Dr. Van Dyken. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you.